Welcome back, everyone, to this wonderful second session with Father Philip Ganier, who, of course, is a priest with the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. Um, as you, we recall, Father Phil is a PhD candidate in catechetics at uh, the Catholic University of America over at Washington, D.C. God bless you next week as we enter into the um, election. election. I know. Yes. And uh, <laughs> and is, is currently a uh, teaching um, undergraduates there uh. in um, theology. Our last session with Father Philip a couple of weeks ago provided you know an excellent uh, foundation for part one of the uh, the new directory for our catechesis, where we delve into revelation and its transmission, the identity, vocation, and formation of the catechist. You know, and we were reminded that all of us, each one of us, the body of Christ is called to share a, 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 in a beautiful way, the charismatic and mystagogical catechesis to draw others to Christ through beauty as evidence through the power of music that we experience in, um, in, in the uh, reflection piece that he shared with us. And so, again, I thank mm -hmm. Father Philip for joining us today as he introduces to us part two of the directory for catechesis, the process, process. of catechesis. Okay. Welcome, Father Philip. Thanks so much, Jane. It's always good to be with Yay. you. And uh, it's it's a pleasure to meet everybody online. And so uh, I have a prayer that we can go ahead and get started, which is from uh, the Conference of Catholic Bishops. And so we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Loving Father, Amen. pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us that we might be good catechists, catechists of your word, your Son, Jesus Christ. Render our minds and hearts so open, receptive and responsive to your Holy Spirit, that like Mary, we might become a living instrument of your word to others. Help us to be a faithful witness to gospel life so that your church may become ever more alive. Let the fire of your love so enkindle our hearts that we may be instruments of drawing others to love you in the church of your son. We ask this through Christ our Lord and through the intercession of the whole of Our Lady of Peace and Saints Damien and Marianne of Molokai. Amen. Yes. Father, Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so um, now it's a part two. So as I had mentioned last time, um, you know, I, I live here in Washington, D.C. This is where I'm at. And I live in a community of, of 19 Jesuits who, who we do a number of um, different apostolates in the city. And um, currently, as Jane mentioned, I'm, I am a Ph.D. candidate in catechetics. Um, I also teach undergraduate theology here at the Catholic University of America, just about two to three miles up the street from us. So I realize here that the pacing is going to be fast. Um, and that's because I want us to have time to pray. And there's also a lot of material. But you will have the slides and the recording will be available at the end. In fact, you should be able to see the recording from the first session as well as all of my slides from the first session so that you can digest because I realize there's a lot of material there, some of which is philosophical. So just so that you know. All right, so um, just some terms before we get started once again. Um, I will be using the term a lot, repetitio, which you'll find in a lot of um, uh, Catholics, old school Catholic uh, pedagogy, and which uh, you'll find in a lot of classical Jesuit education as well, this idea of repeating. Repetitio est mater studiorum, which is Latin for repetition is the mother of learning. Sometimes studiorum can be used to translate into zeal. And the reason why I like to use the word repetitio is because the connotation is close to this ideal of zeal. It keeps it kind of like coal that's, that keeps on burning. So repetition, repetition keeps on helping. Uh, it's an old Catholic uh, pedagogical style as, as, as we know, but I will be using that very explicitly today. Um, DC will stand for the Directory of Catechesis. CCC stands for Catechism of the Catholic Church. So a repetitio. Once again, the CCC is the catechism, which is the summary of faith, or to use the Latin term, the fides quae, what we believe. The DC is the directory for catechesis. It's the fides qua, uh, um, 
theologically speaking. It's how you teach this. A repetitio once again, the purpose of our three gatherings is to introduce the directory. It's to engage in dialogue. And so I really appreciate the ways in which, you know, so many of you have asked questions and have offered comments because that helps shape how we engage today as well as our third session. And then I also want to model some methods that the DC here uh, brings to our attention, specifically um, the, these particular methods. Once again, a repetitio charismatic method, which is the proclamation of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the mystagogic method, it's reflection based on the liturgy, an artistic method, which is historically called the via pulchritudinis, the way of beauty. Repetitio, once again, um, we are talking about church documents, and so it is an ecclesial event. You might remember this from the first session. And somebody has had asked a very important question from session one. What are the measurable goals in determining our success in implementing the document? A couple of, uh, one answer here and one question. The goal of the CCC is desire for Christ, simply put, in one phrase. At the same time, we also have to ask a question. How does one measure success for the desire of Christ, pastorally even? That's why um, the church documents have to be seen in terms of what Father Michael Driscoll says. They have to be interpreted pastorally. So how does one catechize throughout the natural journey of life, especially when it comes to, let's say, um, coming of age, curiosity, um, confusion, rebellion, joy, suffering, especially in terms of loss, uh, divorce, and just and chron chronic illness, or the end of life? And so it makes sense then that for Father Michael Driscoll, you know, when we talk about church documents, we are talking about an ecclesial event. It is an, ecclesi it is an opportunity for the church to gather, to celebrate, uh, to discern, to pray, reflect, digest, what have you, to be church with one another. So that's why it's really important to think of it in terms of an ecclesial, an ecclesial event here. Um, here's an approach. So my approach here is analysis. And so, um, you know, when we think about, let's say, diagramming sentences, for instance, uh, you know, we take it apart so that we understand how a sentence works. We, we talk about how to, we take computers apart so we understand how computers work. And to use a food analogy, if we're talking about, let's say, trying to make the best spam fried rice, we're going to take it apart. We're going to see whether or not Okay, what makes the best fried rice? What are dry rice, shoyu, eggs, green onions? What kind of onions? Kimchi or no kimchi? Oyster sauce, no oyster sauce? In my, partic in my particular opinion, I think that the best kimchi actually uses pates, which is fish sauce. But that's me. You know, I think that that's the way, <laughs> that's what I learned there. But if we're talking about the best types of dishes, you got to take it apart so you know how to put it back together again. And I think that when we're talking about educational ministries in the church, we have to take, we have to break it down, the components part. So if you remember from last week, I talked about this particular diagram and we talked about what makes education different from religious education, from catechesis, from mystagogy. We also talked about um, evangelization and charisma. So once again, a repetitio from session one. The catechism summarizes the content of faith. The catechetical directory guides how the catechism should be taught. The missionary disciple idea from Pope Francis expands the identity of the catechist from religion teacher to an evangelist. The charisma anchors teaching in the explicit proclamation of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection in a person's life. Catechesis is mystagogic initiation to the extent that we are um, intentional about reflecting on the liturgical experience and connecting that to an experience of real life. The virtue mercy allows the catechist to adopt a healing mode if needed. The church's recovery of the via pulchritudinis or the way of mercy is a privileged way for God to capture, seize, and shape our lives for a life of truth and goodness. 
So when we look back here at this particular diagram, kerygma and evangelization really goes into all parts here of you know, the, the enterprise of, the, of education in the church. And somebody made a very, in the first session, someone made a very important observation, especially those of you who are teaching in the Catholic schools. Well, not all students are Catholic, true enough, because, you know, the church educates broadly. Look at our universities, look at your schools. I mean, you have everybody there, not just Catholics. And so it's important that for catechists, we become very um, agile. We got to go into, we got to move in and out of these circles all the time. Even at Catholic University and at Notre Dame, where I did uh, my master's degree in music, we had atheists and agnostics in these very famous you know, Catholic universities. And it's through, let's say, especially in works of science or music and where I, I had degreed, where you know, uh, you know, friends of mine or colleagues and, for, and stu former students you know, struggle with their faith or just don't come with any faith at all or are resistant to faith. So we meet them where they're at. And there are times, you know, maybe we, can't, we might be charismatic in a moment of accompaniment or let's say mandatory schools and school liturgies, for instance, perhaps, you know, a non-Catholic student recognizes, oh, there's moments of peace, faith, hope and love. And we as catechists can help tease that out and say, that moment of love is, is a way in which the Lord is speaking to you. So that's one way and we can anchor those who are not Catholic in Mustagoji and, and walk with them in that accompaniment. So part two of uh, the directory, <clears throat> these, are the, uh, these are the chapters. So the tone shifts are, are striking. They're subtle, but yet significant. In 1971, we can probably summarize it with the word method, where they used elements of methodology, um, catechesis according to, to grade levels. The 1997 directory talks about pedagogy and it resurrected this idea of the pedagogical method, um, something that had lain dormant for centuries. It talks about the pedagogy of the faith and those to be catechized. This year in 2020, the, I think a key word here is process. Yes, it is inclusive of 1971 and 1977, but this year's directory emphasizes this element of process. That, that, and we're also talking about process specifically in the lives of persons, real personhood here, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. When we look at the trajectory of the, of the, of the DC, you start off, today we're talking about the process of catechesis. The first part we talked about identity. It's going to move in and refract over here and move out into what I would call catechesis incarnate. So catechesis in particular churches. We're going to transition. So notice chapter one, which you talked about last time was revelation. So theory, the idea of identity, it's going to end on chapter 12, which we'll talk about in two weeks in terms of the organisms and the ways in which catechesis is incarnate. But yet today we're going to transition between, between theory and, and practicality here. There is an intimate relationship between the catechism and the incarnation here, and it's going to meet right over here today. The kerygma by review is simultaneously an act of proclamation and the content of proclamation itself, a repetitio from last time. So the content, the central idea is here. And then the, the act of proclamation making this idea explicit. There are many formulations of the kerygma, and you, if you look at the DC 58 footnote 5, it gives you a number of ways in which the kerygma can be made manifest. And here are some scriptural ways. Let's take a look at number two right over here. The kingdom of God is at hand and believe in, repent and believe in the gospel. So if that's the kerygma, you say it, then we have to ask, well, how do you teach this? Think about this. Okay, that's the kerygma. You proclaimed it. Okay, so what do you do now? And so that's something that I think that we can we can kind of unpack. And I know that as, as people who have been in the classroom, you have many different ideas. You can say it to someone when appropriate. You can preach it. 
Um, you could show videos on John the Baptist. You can do a Bible study on Mark. You can teach people how to pray with it. Reflect on personal social sin. Teach the sacrament of reconciliation. Teach theology of sin, the seven deadlies. Model repentance. You can model repentance through personal testimony. You can share art and music on sin and redemption in many, many different ways. But that's kind of where we're going for today. Theory, practice, and transitioning in between. One of the beautiful phrases of the new DC is this idea of pathways of catechesis. There is no one exclusive method, no one exclusive way, one specific time. To what extent do we cultivate different pathways in order to create what I would call a catechetical culture? Or another way to think about it is, especially in light of the hokulea, you know, and, and the idea of voyaging, think of it in terms of constellation. To what extent can we provide a constellation of catechetical experiences, because it's not just one moment necessarily. So now let's take a look at chapter five, which is the pedagogy of the faith. And here uh, we talk about um, the divine pedagogy, you know, so revelation, you know, through pedagogy. We'll talk about pedagogy of the faith of the church, the criteria. And then here, um, human sciences. And I notice that that arrow is going the other direction because I'll postpone it till session three. So let's take a look at revelation through pedagogy here. Dr. Patrick Wiley, who's a professor of catechetics at the Franciscan University of Steubenville, talks about um, the word pedagogy. And he says that the contemporary use is associated with education. However, it has a long theological history from St. Paul and the Church Fathers, from St. Clement of Alexandria and St. Irenaeus of Lyon. The ancient Greek and Roman use of pedagogy is through pedagogue, literally one who leads the child. He was a servant, a highly educated slave who would lead the child to or from school and accompanies and forms the child. But the term has been renewed in the 20th century catechetical documents, especially in the 1997 directory. So what does this all mean? Theologically, Dr. Wiley says that God has the preeminent role in formation through revelation. We have a revelation through pedagogy. That revelation is the great educational work of God from DC 157. That means that God continues to educate us. And Christ is the particular way that God educates. So we pay very specific attention to, to who Jesus is. And there happens to be, I think, a very strong, compelling connection between slaves and Christ. We recall the Philippians hymn here, where we talk about kenosis. We can just go ahead and glance at the Philippians hymn. He emptied himself as a slave, outpouring himself. And he, he modeled that service outwards to others through the washing of the feet and the breaking of the bread. Someone had asked last time, what is the greatest revelation of the document? And I think that the question actually contains the answer. It's specifically revelation. That the revelation of God is the one that practically orients our relationality, not only with God, but with others. So that the ideas about God and tradition must be grounded in the living God and in persons. Otherwise, God simply becomes an idea and Jesus becomes a nice guy. And, he, and we know that Jesus is more than a nice guy. If we take a look at the criterion here, I will frame it in terms of the admonition from 167 quotes from Evangelii Gaudium, where it says, there are times when the faithful, in listening to completely orthodox language, take something alien to the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ, because that language is alien to their own way of speaking and to understanding one another. We sometimes give them a false god or human ideal, which is not really Christian. In this way, we hold fast to a formulation while failing to convey its substance. So the way how I'm thinking about these five criteria, which the DC talks about, is in terms of temptation. Sometimes we might be tempted to think of love being a feeling, that love is focused on the self. But the criterion corrects it. The truth is this. The Trinity models love outward, and through Jesus, we have purpose in life and death. Temptation. God could not possibly love me or us. The world is fundamentally evil. The criterion corrects it. Christ's love saves and works in the world to bring it to fulfillment. 
temptation. I can be saved if I work hard enough, know enough. Beauty is a decoration. Correction. Grace saves and it is a gift. If something is beautiful, it necessarily leads to goodness and truth. Temptation. Faith is a private choice. Correction. Faith is necessarily ecclesial, that is, church. Human beings are not solo, but relational. Temptation. We can just pick and choose our faith. Correction. God calls us to unity and wholeness, albeit gradually at times. So here we go to the next chapter, chapter six, on the, on the actual catechism. Okay, so I will talk about the catechism in terms of genre, catechesis as theology, and supplementary material. All right, so in terms of the genre of what the CCC actually is, so take a look once again. This is where the placement of chapter six is in relation to the trajectory. We, we did part one last time. We just talked about chapter six. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, we, we are talking about chapter six right now. And chapter six of the catechism ends with theory. Okay, and then chapter seven, in just a little bit, will begin with the incarnation. So here we are uh, now ending in theory, which culminates in what the catechism is. When we talk about catechism, we are talking about a universal catechism. There have been many, many catechisms throughout history, but very few universal catechisms. And this one that came out in 1992, it was promulgated at 30 years after Vatican II. 400 years ago, more or less, we had another universal catechism which was the Council of Trent in response to the Protestant Reformation. And in between, we had many local catechisms, some of which, I mean, one of which you might remember, the Baltimore Catechism, which, which gained a lot of traction during the 19th and 20th centuries in the United States. Editions of the current universal catechism in English are these. You have the, the Brown Book, which was promulgated in 1992, originally written in French. You have the Green Book, which is the second edition promulgated in 97, which was a revision using the official Latin translation of the 1992 French. It includes an index and a glossary. And then you have currently the Blue Book, which is the revised second edition. And it, has, it was published in 2019. Only one change to this edition, which is, has to do with capital punishment. So if you want the most recent edition, you want the Blue Book. There's no change except a revision of paragraphs 2267 promulgated by Pope Francis. The church teaches in light of the gospel that the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person. And she works with determination for its abolition worldwide. If you want to use the brown book or the, gre or the green book, that's totally fine as well. Just realize that there is a change in paragraph 2267. When we talk about parts of the catechism, there are four. The, the, boxed, um, the boxes over here, creed, sacraments, our father, and the 10 commandments, that is the way that Trent, the, 400, the, the, the catechism 400 years ago, had talked about uh, catechesis and it, it split them up into four pillars, if you will. The current understanding post-Vatican II has renamed these. Um, now talks about profession of faith, celebration of the Christian mystery, life in Christ, which is really morality, and then Christian prayer. So it expands it from the Our Father. Why the change? Vatican II. And Pope Paul VI says that Vatican II is the great catechism of modern times. In order to understand the current editions of the catechism, we have to understand the major documents of Vatican II. Of the 16 documents, four are regarded as constitutions foundational to conciliar teaching. The first, the Constitution on Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, from, uh, promulgated in 1963. The Dogmatic Constitution of the Church, Lumen Gentium, in 1964. Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, uh, Dei Verbum, in 1965. And the Pastoral Constitution of the Church in the Modern World, 1965 as well. 
These are foundation of all the 16. What do these mean? Monsignor Paul McPartland, who is the ordinary professor of history, historical and systematic theology, I think gives a great diagram in terms of how these documents are related to one another and to understand the architecture of this current catechism. A former professor, I think one of the best teachers. And he draws out how these documents re are related to one another. The first, Dave, notice that Christ is in the center. The document De Verbum is, is what draws it close to, to Christ. Sacrosanctum Concilium, liturgy is a source and summit for the church. Lumen Gentium, the idea is that church is the body of Christ. And then Gaudium et Spes, church is in solidarity with the world. So it centers around Christ, is anchored in scripture, expressed in liturgy, extended to the church, and radiates out to the world. Notice that these, these arrows of Gaudium et Spes, the world influences the church, the church evangelizes the world. There is a harmony. There is a way in which we see the world in a positive light, unlike the century before, where the church and, and world were so antagonistic towards one another. But these, if you understand these four documents, which I commend to your reading as essential, this gives you a foundational sense of the theory and the theological architecture of the catechism. So that is the difference between the Council of Trent 400 years later to our current universal catechism refracted through Vatican II. Now let's talk about uh, the directory for catechesis here. You will notice that in the abbreviation section, it absorbs the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And you can see those four constitutions here on church, uh, scripture, liturgy, and um, the relationship to the world. When you take a look here at uh, catechesis as theology, the idea here is this that catechesis oftentimes has to kind of, it has its foot in theology and it has its foot in education. Theology, uh, and other people might disagree with the way how I, how I split this up, but this is one way in which we can understand theology in its wholeness, I think. Systematic theology is what we believe about God. Liturgical and sacramental theology is how we celebrate and worship God. Moral and pastoral theology, how we live in response to God. Catechesis kind of has to blend all of these together. We live in all three. At the same time, we also live over here too. Education, teaching in the faith or teaching about the faith because not everybody's Catholic. You know, so we have to, we have to give you know, people you know, a, a, an education about faith as well. Catechesis has to meet constantly right here in the center. Catechesis is teaching theology in the faith. That's how theology and, and, and education have to come together. And it's always a tension, you know, that we have to, otherwise, because if we, we become too focused on this, we forget, you know, the educational efficacy. If we become so focused on education, we, forgot, we forget the theological significance. Now let's talk about supplementary material um, in this compendium. Once again, a repetitio, the comparison between the catechism is the what of faith versus the directory, which is the how of faith. It'll talk about the compendium, which is a synthesis of the catechism. They call it a vada mecum, a handbook. Pope Benedict XVI describes three principal characteristics of the compendium. It's close reliance on the catechism. It is dialogical in that it uses questions and answers and its use of art. So if you take a look over here, right over here to the right, it kind of has a question and answer format. It uses art and what's neat about it is it has you know, an explanation of the art. The companion, even though that the directory doesn't talk about the companion, I think it's just important, might as well, you know, the companion here is a compendium or a collection of texts in the catechism. John Paul talks about the treasures of the tradition and it follows a four part structure, just so like what we talked about earlier, the profession, celebration, life in Christ and Christian prayer. You'll notice that the companion is actually thicker than the catechism here. 
because it has all of these documents. So if you take a look on the left hand side is the catechism, it'll give you these notes which I've enlarged right over here. And all of these things are spelled out here in the compendium to your right so that you have a fuller sense of what those documents actually say. As opposed to the commentary, the commentary just recently came out and it was published by our Sunday Visitor in 2019, which provides theological reflection on the Blue Book, directed and coordinated by Bishop Rito Fisichella. And you'll notice that there are all of these essays, which is in the second part of this particular rendition of the Catechism. Repetitio, once again, you have the compendium, which is the synthesis, you have the companion, which is an expansion of the texts, and then you have the commentary, which is the theological reflection. All right, now we're moving along to chapter seven, methodology and catechesis. So while I get a drink of tea, why don't you take a look at how that, uh, look at the table of contents there. <clears throat> Okay, so a few points here. We'll talk about content and method, the plurality of methods, as well as this idea of space, which is fairly developed you know, in this directory. So first on content and method, once again, the comparison between the CCC and the DC. The content, this is the summary. <laughs> the method, this is how you teach the content or how this directory guides the content. Once again, the placement of this chapter in this whole trajectory here, it's right over here. If we're ending with theory with the catechism, now we're gonna start talking about how, what this looks like, how it's applied. And the key idea here is gonna be with the incarnation. The mystery of the incarnation, it says in DC 194, inspires catechetical pedagogy. Without the incarnation, then faith becomes simple ideas. The church becomes a multinational corporation and Jesus simply becomes a historical figure, someone who, didn't li who doesn't live now. That's why we need it. It'll talk about plurality of methods here. And here I will list the five that it talks about, human experience, memory, language, group, space. DC 195 says that catechesis does not have a single method, but it is open to evaluating different methods, engaging in pedagogy and didactics and allowing itself to be guided by the gospel for recognizing the truth of human nature. In this, when it talks about language here, it'll talk about narrative language, artistic language, and digital language. We'll, we'll, we'll postpone digital language in two weeks and we'll talk about digital culture. Um, but I'll focus on this idea of language, especially on art, and this idea of space, because they're very distinct in this edition of the directory. As far as art, we know that the church has treasures of art, and we don't have to go into this, but it's important just to be reminded of the many ways in which art permeates our faith life. Images, literature, stained glass, drama, music, film, what have you. And somebody uh, the last time had a discussion from this first session had asked a very important question. How do we inspire appreciation for art when it is so different from the experience of youth or when you may be res or when youth may be resistant to it? That's a really important question because sometimes, you know, young people just don't have or even adults don't have the faith, don't have the not the faith, but don't have the, the taste for things that are sacred necessarily. And here I wanted to talk about, you know, an experience that I had when I taught at Jesuit High School in Sacramento. I had to teach choir, English, and theology. And I inherited the liturgical choir, and they have a tradition of singing the Salve Regina, you know, at the start of every single class. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, et spes nostra salve. It's, it's the Hail Mary, uh, Hail Holy Queen, excuse me which is sung traditionally after night prayer from Pentecost to this first Sunday of Advent. When I saw this and when I started working, here's a picture of not this, I didn't work with this particular choir, but this is an example of the choir that I worked with. When I worked with this choir, this is at our graduation liturgy. I wondered, do they actually sing this? Do they, do they like chant? 
And my mentor teacher, a very wise Jesuit, had corrected, had shown me and proven me otherwise because I was mistaken, because I assumed that young people did not like, quote unquote, old music. I was mistaken that young people did not like challenging music. I was graced because I came to see through my mentor teacher that I discovered that students really value not only traditions, but the tradition, even if they might rebel. And so when we look at, let's say, the method here, one of the things that I came to realize is reinforced here, see in DC 202. What is essential is that the texts that are memorized, as these young men did, be taken in and gradually understood in depth in order to become a source of Christian life on the personal and community level. And so I came to see that when we started singing Salve Regina, not only in liturgies, we said every single day, or in concert performances or in classes. I mean, it, it was something that came stitched in and embedded in the life of these young men. I also came to realize too that my mentor teacher was modeling for me an ancient Greek persuasion theory, that of pathos, ethos, and logos. Very quickly, pathos is that you know, the teacher appealed to student emotion. Ethos is that the teacher set a personal example, you know, by modeling, you know, singing the Salve Regina is a good thing, and I do it. He also appealed to its significance, so he was able to appeal to their intellect as well. We know that a the the theological connection to Logos is really important. We have Jesus as word. And so the teacher, my mentor, taught them how to pray with the Salve Regina. So it became anchored in Jesus, and that sustained them. That, so when they left Jesuit high school, the Salve Regina became a way for them to remember, this is how the church prays. It's also this old Catholic idea of repetitio est mater studiorum, singing this song over and over and over again at the start of every single class is gonna do something to you. It's gonna have some kind of muscle memory so that when you're tired or when you're frustrated or when you're singing at a funeral, it, it penetrates you in different ways. And here um, I'll conclude this section by a discussion on space. Space here is very important and I'll, I'll, I'll quote big sections of it here. You can see here in DC 221 that it talks about the importance of space, especially with space dedicated to the liturgy. But look at what's here in DC 20, 222. The widespread environments that are patterned after school, school buildings do not constitute the best places for the unfolding of catechetical activities. Think about that. Because liturgy, because catechesis is essentially mystagogical, it has to be grounded in worship space. And here, once again, I'll, I'll share with you um, an experience, my experience of teaching in the high schools. Uh, one of the high schools where I taught at was in Sacramento, and here we had the fortune of, of, of building a new chapel, which was um, the architects here were Hodgetts and Fung, based in Los Angeles, and we created, you know, a new chapel here. And we had to imbue it with all of these theological ideas here, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Here's a picture of the school campus in Sacramento. And the yellow arrow shows you where the, the chapel is located. Inside the chapel, we wanted to emphasize this idea of pilgrimage, which is a Vatican II idea, that when you come in and, are, and bless yourself, the idea is, is you walk through you walk through because you know this is this idea of this church on pilgrimage. Parts of the wall of it here have on the right hand side the North American martyr saints are etched into the walls, and on here on the left side the Hail Mary, which the North American martyrs taught in um, Canada and New York, currently today, were presented in English, um, uh, French, Latin, and Wendat or Huron as as they came to be known. You walk through the space and you can see where let's this has the student body is a thousand boys and here it's 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 big enough for a class about 250 but you can kind of see as to how you know light and space interact with one another 
And the pilgrimage ends over here in the in the inside, in this inner sanctum where you have the Blessed Sacrament and this, uh, this tender kisses icon, which we commissioned from Mount Athos in Greece as a way to emphasize the incarnationality of God. But that became a way for people to teach and you know, to learn. I also recognize, too, that not everybody has access to a chapel. You know, not everybody has those types of resources. Some places do, but a lot of places don't. But if you look at, let's say, the worship spaces, um, you know, in the Diocese of Honolulu, see the marvelous ways in which church spaces in Honolulu and in the diocese and in Hawaii can teach. You know, to what extent, you know, it, you know, maybe is there a book or a website on these sacred spaces? And do we take advantage of the ways in which our architecture teaches and shapes us in faith? Or even like the ideas of going to places, let's say like the pilgrimage to Jubilee Doors, let's say at Our Lady of Peace or perpetual adoration chapels or praying with monastics as we have in, in Wailua. Or, you know, these COVID days, you know, what about virtual space? Visiting churches, like let's say in Jerusalem where Jesus died and was risen, or our mother church, St. Peter's Basilica, or our mother church for the United States in, in Washington, D.C., or watching films about ongoing on pilgrimage, in this case, this Martin Sheen movie, um, to Cant the Compostela in Spain, worshiping at uh, the Church of St. James, or even uh, taking or appropriating recent events about sacred spaces, especially all the tensions surrounding Hagia Sophia in Turkey, could be ways in which architecture, you know, can be ways in which uh, that can be, we can use that to teach. We also have prayer in virtual space. So let's say adoration going online and see on the right-hand side how prayer intentions are used or liturgy of the hours. Let's say the monks, you can join the monks in the Mount of uh, St. Abbey, uh, in, the, in the Abbey in, um, in Oregon. Or one of my Jesuit brothers talks about leading an Ignatian retreat online and how those videos can be ways in which we can meet each other through prayer or encounter in virtual space in real time. Um, once again, my Jesuit brothers and I, along with our colleagues, had, had gathered our colleagues together for praying virtually, Vesper, the night prayer or Vespers, um, where we joined our Father General in Rome and where we prayed from a key important place in, in, in Spain, joining with um, our coworkers and colleagues from around the world. And you can see on the bottom here, ways in which people tuned in and prayed at various times during Pentecost. Or we can talk about consecrating space. So where are places in our homes or corners, or in this case on the left-hand side, even a closet that can be places for prayer or you know, a place in our home with Advent coming up for, for Advent wreaths or with Dia de los Muertos coming up next Monday, you know, altars and ways in which we can remember the dead. A consideration here that I thought I'd include, uh, one of the things I like to listen to is, is um, the Project Kuleana, which is a, a project of the Native Hawaiian people to be able to record and teach, uh, teach their young the, the important songs, the important bits of their culture so that they pass it down you know, to younger people. But all of a sudden the internet becomes a place in which people remember, people gather, and people share. Look at Kaulana Napua, 2.8 million views. You know, but how that becomes a way in which, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's not, we're not talking about a Christian movement here, but notice how this becomes a strong educational and cultural movement. Could this be something in ways in which the church could consider evangelizing? When you think about, let's say, songs that Hawaiian Catholics should know. I mean, Kanaka Vai Vai was something that the sisters once taught to me when I was in third grade at St. Elizabeth School in Iaea. This became a way in which the sisters taught to me, you know, um, you know, the gospel from Matthew 17. A consideration. We continue with space here, and we can see, for instance, that the, the directory encourages that we think about catechesis in different places, not just church, not just the classroom, but also the home, the office, cultural and recreational environments, even prisons. 
And here, I want to pause in just a little bit to, to show a film clip on Wit, uh, a film that came out in 2001, which was by Mike Nichols. And it talks about, you know, it was based on this book uh, that came out in 1999, a Pulitzer Prize winning book, a one act play by Margaret Edson, that talked about you know, the life of, you know, a young, of a fairly young woman who was dying of stage four cancer. And so this particular um, scene here is a place that I would argue in the hospital could be a place for catechesis. And I'll set the scene up for you here. You might remember that in our first session, we did a little uh, prayer and meditation on this piece by Arvo Peart, Spiegel and Spiegel. We'll do a repetitio of this once again, <clears throat> of Arva Peart's music, as, as I talked about in the first session, is he's an Estonian composer, uh, now the second most um, played living composer right now, and a recipient of a theology prize, which is ironic because he didn't write any theology. He composed music. But this music grounds, you'll, you'll hear it in just a little bit, it grounds this particular scene in wit. A little bit more context here. On the left-hand side, Emma Thompson plays Vivian Baring, and Eileen Atkins plays Evelyn Ashford, who's here on the right. Notice when I play this film clip, Arvo Peart's Spiegel and Spiegel is in the soundtrack, what you listened to last time. I would argue that this is a very pastoral event because these are two English professors. Um, Evelyn taught Vivian in grad school, and now they're encountering one another at the end of Vivian's life. Evelyn comforts Vivian. It's also a liturgical scene because Evelyn says at the end, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest which is a quote from Shakespeare, but it is, it is a trope in our funeral liturgy. It's catechetical because Margaret Wise Brown's story, The Runaway Bunny, is used as an allegory to the soul. You'll see that over here on the left-hand side. Uh, it's in that scene. The catechesis here is that wherever it hides, God will find it. Look at the place of encounter, which is a hospital, and look at the time of encounter, which is the end of life. A very important lesson that that Evelyn teaches Vivian is through the poetry of John Donne. You find this earlier in the film where Evelyn teaches, it's not, and death shall be no more, semicolon, death, capital D, comma, thou shalt die, but rather, and death shall be no more, comma, death, small d, thou shalt die. The significance is in the punctuation. Evelyn tells Vivian that death is not something to act out on stage. In other words, death is not something to be overly dramatic about because it's not the end. It is a pause. It is a comma to eternal life. Okay? So when I play this, as you're watching, Recall for yourself a special place where you had a significant experience of God or a lesson about God. And as the scene unfolds, how does the Lord teach you through important places and people? Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to connect us here to the video. Can everybody see this? Thumbs up? Okay. Can everybody hear this? Okay, here we go. I'm gonna try this once again. So here we are, um, Evelyn is visiting Vivian at the, end of their at, at the end of her life. She is now dying of cancer. You will hear Arvo Peart's Spiegel im Spiegel, which you which you listened to the first session two weeks ago.
Vivian? Vivian? It's evening. Vivian? visiting my great-grandson who is celebrating his fifth birthday. I went to see you in your office and they directed me here. Oh, I've been walking all over town. I'd forgotten how early it gets chilly here. Oh, I feel so bad. Yes, I know you do. I can see. Oh, dear. Oh, there, there. There, there. Oh, Vivian. Vivian. recite something to you? Would you like that? Or recite something by Don? No. Mm -hmm. Very well. Mm. Let's see. Runaway Bunny by Margaret Wise Brown. Pictures by Clement Hurd. Copyright 1942. First Harper Trophy Edition 1972. Once there was a little bunny who wanted to run away. So he said to his mother, I'm running away. If you run away, said his mother, I will run after you, for you are my little bunny. If you run after me, said the little bunny, I will become a fish in a trout stream, and I will swim away from you. If you become a fish in a trout stream, said his mother, I will become a fisherman, and I will fish for you. Ah, oh, look at that. A little allegory of the soul. Wherever it hides, God will find it. See, Vivian? If you become a fisherman, said the little bunny, I will be a bird and fly away from you. If you become a bird and fly away from me, said his mother, I will be a tree that you come home to. Ah, oh, very clever. Oh. Shucks, said the little bunny. I might just as well stay where I am and be your little bunny. And so he did. Have a carrot, said the mother bunny. Hmm. Wonderful. Time to go.
flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Now, what I'd like to do for a few minutes here, like for about three minutes or so, in your own meditation, and I'll use the Spiegel and Spiegel soundtrack once again, think about the place. Think about the place in which you were taught, where God taught you, maybe directly or through a, another person. And in about three minutes or so, Jane will split you up into groups and we'll have um, a session, a sharing session for about uh, eight minutes. Okay, so we'll now split up, up into groups and uh, please feel free to share any movement of the heart that you had through your reflection or even um, impressions of the film. Um, but the, the idea is to focus in on this idea of how God uses space, you know, to teach us space. The film brings us to a catechetical moment in a hospital, you know, and through an old, a former teacher that we found at the end, that Vivian found at the end of life. What was it, what is it for you? What spaces where God teaches you? Okay. Thank you, Thank you Father Philip. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the breakout rooms, um, you will be automatically, randomly assigned to different rooms so that you can uh, meet with each other and, and enjoy each other's company and share. Um, so you'll be receiving a little window to join the room, and then you'll be receiving um, at the end of about eight minutes um, a call back that will give us 30 seconds to end our conversations and then return to this meeting space. So 
Thank you and enjoy your time together. God bless. Welcome well, back, everybody. So I'll talk for 10 more minutes and then we'll talk for 10 minutes. So um, I hope that your conversations went well. Take a look now at our final chapter, chapter eight in section two, Catechesis in the Lives of Persons. Um, just a minute, just to take a look at how it's, how the chapter is organized. I will talk uh, very briefly on this idea of family. And then I don't have an arrow here because I don't, I, I think it's not so much we need to go per category of person, but just talk about some general principles of how to understand why they, they talk about these different people here. As far as family is concerned, um, there is, because of, because of time, um, I'm just gonna move along with these slides, but there are th three very important paragraphs here, which are very unique, what they call new family scenarios. And um, with the slides, I encourage you to, to take a look at that. The point is that we have to work on, we have to be aware of what they call heterogeneous family realities, different type of families we need to accompany and discern. New family scenarios. So I, I really, I think it's a very uh, essential that you take a look at to what the directory says about this in terms of what it means to accompany people. And I think that especially in light of ohana, you know, uh, a, a term that, that we all know in Hawaii, I, I think that this is a great way for us to just kind of relate what family means and how what catechesis means in light of family, especially you have three sessions from Dr. Joanne Paradise about what family catechesis means. But these are three paragraphs that I think it's essential reading. Um, general principles here that are important um, in understanding what it means to catechize persons. The first is this, there is an emphasis on this idea of lives of persons. 1997, they talked about those to be catechized, but here it's a very subtle but important theological idea here that is, that's worth mentioning. Every one of the baptized called to the maturity of faith has the right to, ad, to adequate catechesis. The gospel is not intended for humanity in the abstract, but for each human being, real, concrete, historical, rooted in a particular situation. Concretely, do we know the difference between students? You know, sometimes, uh, I mean, I know for myself that when I'm teaching, let's say brothers and sisters or twins, students are different or between spouses, within families. Can we tell differences between ethnic groups? You know, we joke about it all the time in Hawaii, but in all seriousness, can we, can we make distinctions between them? or within them, not all Filipinos are the same. For instance, between age groups, between parishes, um, between generations, within generations even, you know, because not all older people are the same. Not all younger people are the same. Can we see each person as person individually? The theological foundation is here. Jesus is a living person, not someone who lived in the past, nor is Jesus a philosophy or an idea or a nice guy. But notice that here on the left-hand side, the DC talks about catechesis to all these different people that they have articulated, knowing that the full list cannot be exhausted. It also talks about catechesis for catechists like us. Groups of catechists, like us. Catechesis for clergy, like me and others. Father Paul, who's here, and the deacons who are here as well. But again, this is a very important idea. Pathways to catechesis. Can we provide these? Um, a note on discernment. You'll see um, these numbers over here. By my count, I've counted four times in 1971 that the word discernment or form discernment has been used. And usually it's in the form of spiritual journey or discerning what types of methods to use, discerning God's will. 
by my count, I've, I counted 23 in 1997, and it adds discernment and enculturation, discernment in relation to other religions when we work with them, diverse circumstances. And in 19, uh, in 2020, I, I, by my count, I see uh, 28. And discernment here is in terms of beauty, digital cultures, pastoral discernment, and what they call evangelical discernment. The point is, discernment becomes even more critical a criterion. In the book Catholicism by, uh, by Richard McBride, he notes that it's, it's not so much defined so much in the, in the catechism, but discernment is really linked with prudence, the virtue uh, in the catechism, which is discerning good than the correct means to accomplish it, or another way to look at it, the, the virtue of prudence is doing the right thing at the right time in the right amount. When you use the term between discernment, um, we are talking, uh, or discerning between goods especially, in the, uh, in the spiritual tradition of St. Ignatius, to which I belong, um, discernment is basically an increase of faith, hope, and love, the consolations, and decrease, and desolation is a decrease of faith, hope, and love. These are not feelings, but spiritual states. These are not just what's also important too. It's not just personal decision-making, but one makes a decision in light of the whole body of Christ. In the first session, I had you listen to this particular piece of music as a way to give, get you in touch very directly with the Lord. Imagine the Lord speaking to you. And so when we talk about the practical application, on the left-hand side here, application makes no catechetical sense unless we ask who guides your application. Are you in tune with him? And so the, the, the image of music, I think, is very appropriate. And here's, I'm very serious about this. If you need help in learning how to listen to the Lord, because that can sometimes be tricky, seek help from a spiritual director. And if you have more questions, we can certainly talk about that in, in just a few minutes. Um, so now, um, as we close, former, uh, to re repeat, the DC recognizes that to catechize is to engage in a process. The CCC is a general summary of faith and requires mediation through a variety of different methods appropriate to persons and situations. More than an educational term, pedagogy expresses an ancient theological truth that God teaches us by revealing himself to us. Because God revealed himself through Jesus, God modeled divine love by emptying himself, the word kenosis here, that Paul uses, and providing our life and death meaning and purpose. Because of the incarnation, catechesis is not possible unless it is woven into the lives of persons, individually and the full spectrum of the full human family. The classroom cannot be the only venue for catechesis. Since catechesis is mystagogical, worship spaces are privileged spaces for instruction. And since catechesis is evangelical, other, place, other places like hospital rooms are possibilities as well. Discernment is the ability to identify movements of consolation that is an increase of faith, hope, and love, or desolation, a decrease of faith, hope, and love in a person's life. The key principle here is that faith seeks understanding. That is the beginning point. The world thinks of it as that we need to understand first, then believe. But the church's approach is we believe first, then we can understand. So it's now, uh, we have 10 minutes left, uh, right on the dot. If you have any questions uh, or comments, please feel free to text them. And, and I'm here to sit for, for 10 minutes at least, and I'm here to sit for as long as you want right afterwards. We do have a question in the chat. Um, so I'll just go ahead and raise it here. And the question please. is, uh, the question is so um, multi regarding multi general generational catechesis. Yes, uh, it, it definitely looks different now that we are limited in how we can come together as a parish community outside of mass. So, any recommendations on how to enhance the gift of the developing domestic church on a multi generational level? 
Um, my one of my Jesuit brothers, his name is Tree Din, and in um, Cal, he works does this Christus Ministries in California, and his theory um, is because his his theory is develop a young adult ministry. And because I think I think a lot of the theory is okay. Focus on the youth. Yes, that's that's true. Yeah, of course we got to focus on the youth. We got to focus on of course. But if you develop young adult ministries, if you really concentrate on that, everything else will follow. And when I worked in the young, and when I worked in the parish, we we just we just didn't we didn't have the funds to do everything, so we focused on young adult ministry. And we found over the course of a few years, my goodness, well, young adults are going to have kids, you know, and it's like, okay, there, there you go. There you have, you know, young children's ministry. Those kids are going to grow into teenagers. These young adults can also do, inter can also interact with intergenerational, uh, with the older folks, because that becomes a way in which they can do relating. Um you know what was what was very interesting is that when the young adults started to gather together that is the 30 40 year olds can you imagine what happened then the 50 year olds started to come to us and were like well the 50 year olds want to gather you know and then like the sexy 60 the, the they call them the sexy 60s like they they wanted to gather as well and then the 70 it just became like this this thing where because of the traction from the from the the young adults that's that's what worked in in our parish um and i know that this judge brother of mine tries to anchor parishes in young adult ministries and then it has like this this spillover effect it was so fascinating but that became a way in which you know younger and older people came together but um, I mean, you're, you're also talking to a musician as well. So I mean, I excuse me, I, I noticed right over here, um, uh, just right here, for instance, that when I was when I talked about this Hawaiian example, the Hawaiian music example here, through this project, uh, the Kuliana project. Where is it? Uh, it's right over here. What what was striking? It was so interesting to me. If you see right over here, this Kuliana project, you know, what, 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 the, what the number of Hawaiians came together and they were talking about doing music and, and passing on the culture to their people. Okay, look at the different generations here. I mean, and they, they kind of gathered together in, with music and the ch they were teaching children. You have the, the, the kupuna, you have the, the, the aunties and uncles, I mean, coming together, you know, rallying around this one project. And it's like, it kind of became this way in which Ohana, you know, strengthened one another. And so, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really, I mean, that's just a couple of things that came to my mind. I am sure that if we, if we open it up, we can, we can certainly discuss it. And, and I'd be happy to, to continue discussing afterwards. But uh, yeah, feel free to, yeah. Thank you. Um, our, our next question is, how do we choose a spiritual director? How do we choose? Well, you, um, I would definitely encourage you at your parish, um, you know, just to, to see if there's even spiritual direction ministry. If not, um, go to your local monastery and ask. Um, you know, like retreat to see if there's a, you know, retreat direction. I mean, Jane, if you know of anybody, if there's like spiritual direction ministry, um, I know we Jesuits, you know, um, have, you know, spiritual direction ministries um, that we can, that, you know, a number of people uh, are doing direction virtually now. Um, go on retreats, learn about what discernment means, um, take courses in spiritual direction, um, but that's really urgent because um, it's so important to know how to how to do that. And like yeah. I said, afterwards we can we can definitely talk about more specifics. Thank you. Yes, um, please speak with your pastor because we do have spiritual directors up here in uh, the diocese of Honolulu. Thank yes. you. Uh, let's see. Linda is asking the question. Um, why haven't our churches focused on classes for all age groups like we have uh, for children and youth? I mean, it's certainly um, a direction that uh, we're speaking about in um, 
in faith formation? Yes, that's a that's a great question. And the the thing that people think is the catechesis is only for children, and I'm like, no, 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 catechesis for everybody, everybody. And so, um, I mean, notice like the 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 screen, the film that I played with, catechesis all the way into the end of life. You know, so that's yeah. I mean, I I would say ask your pastors, get together, talk about. Catechesis, catechesis for catechists. I mean, that's that's for real. Oh yeah, we got to keep on studying. And also to remember the very good point that you brought up, Father Philip, is that catechesis, our our understanding of catechesis is not in the classroom only. Yes. So we do have to remember that we, the baptized, are all called to be catechists, and catechesis yes. takes place where the people are. Exactly, exactly, totally. Let's see, in the chat, um, there's, there's a statement here that says one comment on missionary disciple. I'm not sure what the I, I want is. I wanted to bring a comment that um, okay. from last week on the missionary disciple. When I was first recruited to be uh, to f facilitate children's liturgy, I felt like I didn't have the right stuff. So after I did it for three months, I felt like, well, I already have the right stuff because I believe in God and I have faith in Jesus Christ. So to me, that was important as the messenger. And so I had the confidence even more listening to this concept. I never heard of missionary disciple. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. The church, it's a very new concept for the church since right. 2013 yeah so it's it, a concept. it gave me confidence that okay it's my right and my privilege to evangelize yes yes and i like the word right that's true right yes I had a question. Yes, uh, is that Stephanie or? Uh, Berna. Oh, hi, Berna, um, hi. Yeah, um, we're just starting our youth ministry um, yes. virtually. And nice. um, over the past few years, we've been actually longing for family catechesis and been talking about it and tinkering it for um, a few years now, maybe three years now solid. Uh, but me and my husband have been chatting about it for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but our my, my main concern is, um, how do we, is there like a video or something that we can share with the parents? Because the parents are ultimately going to be overseeing the teenagers or our high schoolers. So yes. is there any type of support that we can give the parents, especially single parents or parents who like say one parent is Catholic, but the other one isn't. And, you know, like all these different challenges that might come aboard as we try to do family catechesis. Yeah, um, I, I, I definitely have some in my mind, um, uh, but it depends like, but there are so many different things that are out there and it depends. I mean, like I, a big place where I like to go a lot is, is, is Father Robert, um, Bishop Robert Barron, you know, but I don't, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes Bishop, sometimes Bishop Barrett needs, because uh, he can speak very, very philosophically. I mean, I imagine that the people that that our Sunday visitor have stuff, or Loyola Press, um, or maybe even Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or Father Bob Spitzer's thing on Catechesis and Science, which we'll talk about next time. Um, but yeah, it, it depends as to what the what the specific need is. Um, the way when I was working in a parish, we had no such thing as family catechesis. That didn't ex We had families, we had catechesis, but family catechesis, we didn't know, I, what is that? Um, and so very basically, it started when a parent came to me and she was kind of, she was very, she was so frustrated because, you know, her son was in eighth grade and was started rebelling you know, and started challenging everything that, you know, she said, and she didn't know how to answer questions. Like, and so 
our first few sessions, if you will. So I spent some time with her just answering her questions. And that's, that's where the need was. And then it kind of became into this thing where, you know, people kind of came together over dinner and parents came together and for support. Oh, when your son asks this, what do you say? When your daughter asks you this, when do you say, you know, and that's kind of how family catechesis happened. It was, there was no program. It was just, and we just tried to put together books, support videos. Um, yeah, that's how we did it. So it depends what the need is, so what is a specific need. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. I, um, I want to be sensitive to time, you know, um, I mean, I'm welcome to stay, you know, as, as long as people like, um, but yeah, Jane, should we just cut it off formally and then let people stay? What do you think? Uh, yes, I, yes, we, yes, I think we should do this. I and mean, we do have one other question in the chat. Um, box, sure, go ahead. And then we will end it. Um, but, I, but I just wanted to uh, make one comment on the, on the question that came up. Um, those are good recommendations uh, Father Philip gave. And in addition to that, um, something like Lexio Divina, you know, and allow parents to lead instead of doing to, um, let's do with. And when they take turns opening, you know, coming to know Christ in sacred scripture, um, just give them, a, you know, some basic tools to lead and then just get out of the way. And as they, as, as parents, meet and speak to each other the way that you did in your breakout groups of where God is in their lives, then the, then the um, relationships between the parents start to build. And then those, that level of trust starts to rise. And then the, how do you do this? How do you deal with this? Um, just sort of pours out. So, so that yeah. may be one idea of um, gathering them around the essential word of God, especially that we can't necessarily get to mass. Some, some feel not safe yet to, uh, to go to mass or watching mass virtually. Um, but if we can manage to, to um, get parents to lead scripture, to lead a conversation, um, then, then I think that that's one of the more fruitful things that we can do. Uh, so the final question before we end formally is um, what ways in a class session can we have our brother and sister, now it's capitalized, so I imagine the question is um, uh, for, uh, for congregations, I guess, for our brother and sister, connect with our catechist. We do retreats and community sharing in addition to classes. Uh, it's religious, religious brothers and sisters. Religious brothers and sisters, meaning like, um, like nuns, like, or just so, bro brothers so, and sisters so, in general. So the person who posed this question, would you unmute yourself so you could um, help us with some clarity? Hi, hey, yes, I'm I'm Ronald from Saint Joseph. Um, hey, Ronald, how's it going? More just a uh, um a class uh like a class setting for um um like young adults and adults. Sometimes you get, you have some that you connect with and some you don't. And that's the ones that we kind of have questions. We had a kind of like a, um, a catechist meeting and we talked about um, that kind of stuff where we share about how we can connect, connect with our with our, with our students at classes. And that was one of the great questions they asked. Yeah. So your, your question is how do you, how do you connect? How do you connect with people? Yeah, we, we do a lot of testimonies, and yeah. sometimes we, 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 we have some of them, and some that we, we just, we look at the people that, you know, have gone and never come back, or what happened, and that's the one that we, yeah. we worry about sometimes, yeah. One of, one of the things that, um, I think that that's something that, you know, um, I'd, I'd certainly be open to what other people might say, but one of the ways how I, I try to do it, you know, and it's not always perfect, is to what, what kind of questions do people have? You know, and I, I, right now, when I teach theology, I, I just try to ask them, what are the big questions that people have? And, and if they don't have any questions, then I try to do some exercises so that they have questions, you know, and, or, because then that they're kind of, they kind of hooked in, they're hooked in, and it's a lot of work trying to answer their questions, <laughs> trying yes, to structure curriculum <laughs> around their questions. <laughs> 
connecting, you know, and, and I also think too, uh, it's, it's also relational, you know, it, it, some, it took, it takes time, I think, to build trust and yeah. Even it's with- a big, really big question uh, sometimes. And I, um, it's, it's part of my, um, my, uh, I kind of lead uh, one of our RCI classes in St. Joseph. And yeah. yeah, that was a big question, how we can continue to engage with others that, you know, fall astray and stuff like that. Yeah. Gosh, the whole falling astray, and there, is, there were all of these studies about people leaving the church. And um, and I believe this was from a Bishop Robert Barron video, and he was talking about like one of the reasons why people leave the church is because there's no personal connection. Mm-hmm. It's not so much it's not so much dogma, it's not so much teachings necessarily, but there was no follow up. There's no reaching out. There was no sense that okay, you matter. At, I I went to Saint Elizabeth's, you know, and we did you know um, at the time we you know we did like the, the YCO movement and. We always had, we had the young Christian lifers who were the, the teenagers. And then we had those people who are a little bit older, like in between, not so much the youth ministers, but the people who are a little bit older. And then they were kind of like mentors, you know, and that sometimes that helped. Even in the young adult ministry that my, my Jesuit brother does, he has, it's young adults, young adults ministry to young adults. But what's interesting is he always has mentors people in their 50s and 60s and 70s. Not too many, but people, but those people kind of, they kind of reach out. They, hey, I didn't see you. Let's let's chat. Let's get together for coffee. You know, young adults, young adult ministry is great because you don't have to worry about permissions and all that type of stuff. I mean, you just, you know, hey, let's meet at Starbucks. Let's get together. Let's talk. But yeah, I, I wonder if it's, it's that type of connection too. And, and also the fact that some people just don't want to connect at this time. And that's okay too. Yeah, I, 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 I wonder if other people have anything to say, you know. Because that's, that's, oh, that's, that's, always a, that's always a challenge. Well, I, I, you know, this is this is my saying. Uh, it's um, I just leave it out to um, God's hand. Some some of my yeah. just leave it, and that's the only way we can do it sometimes. And I, I was just getting some suggestions and what other ways we can do it, you know. And that always got, um, dawns on our minds. But yeah, hopefully it's not too hard a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to tell you that when I, I mean, I remember when I was in at Saint Elizabeth's, I was. Um, I think I was a teenager because you're talking about teenagers. Teenagers. Uh, these are like in um, college and adults. So, college and adults. I mean, I, yeah. I think it's kind. Of, I remember when I was a teenager very distinctly. I got a postcard. Remember when we were selling, uh, sending postcards, and I got a postcard from my youth minister, you know, who teaches at Sacred Hearts, and she sent me a postcard from. She was. She was vacationing in Washington, D.C. And as a, as a teenager, it meant the world to me that somebody thought of me. You know, that just, post, I was like, and I remember when I was doing youth ministry at St. Elizabeth's and I had worked at Newman Center for a little bit, you know, we talked about how the postcard at the time, you know, was so powerful. I don't know. I imagine it still, it still might be, mm-hmm. but it was it was so relational you know and i remember just transitioning into u of eight uh um personal connections i mean for me I, i'm talking personally you know that that meant that meant the world to me or how one of the campus ministers at the time his name was danny and i was an undergraduate at uh and he said hey let's go let's go to um at the time um now HPU is there, but Aloha Tower Marketplace just opened up. And it was one of those times when I was an undergraduate, uh, an undergraduate at UH and said, hey, let's get together for lunch. And I was like, I still remember that. I'm in, I'm 45, I'm 44. And I still remember that when I was 21. I still remember that. We're the same age. Oh, the same. 
<laughs> I still remember that when I was 14. I got that postcard. I got, I still remember that. Those were, yeah, so those were relational moments. Can, can I also I'd say prayer cards? I bought a laminating machine because I love to laminate prayer cards. And I'm always having the kids pick what saint do you want to, to laminate? What prayer do you want? And I'm like always sending them home with prayer cards. And maybe one day they'll find that prayer card in between their homework. And like, oh, yeah, I like this. I like this vis this image and I like this prayer. Yeah, I might yeah. send them home with 10 or 15 and maybe that one prayer card might get them. I have to I show you my I box of prayer cards, Grace. Yeah. yeah. I, I, also, I also do want to go back to um, what Father Philip uh, illustrated for us in that video clip that we watched in this session. Um, because at, at, at all of these moments when we look at when do people tend to flood back to the church in droves, you know, we think of 9-11, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, and, and all of these occasions, certainly death, um, where the church's brilliance and the church's comfort and surrounding and we move toward um, these very precious and sacred times. Um, these catechetical moments speak volumes, you know, to others, um, where, where, where they, they do, they bring, because in that place and in that time, in these moments, Jesus makes sense all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. The Blessed Mother makes sense. The community makes sense. And that's something where you, huh. And so that's why we're, you know, we're continually reminding ourselves that, especially as we go into our holy season, you know, the, of, of um, Advent and Christmas, you know, yeah. Christmas time, of, of an intentional charismatic, an intentional mystagogical catechesis, um, in, in a way that's that's beautiful and that reminds everyone of, of God's presence. So lots of moments um, in in life um, that are not in the classroom that do not require people to come to the parish, as Bishop Larry is always um, asking of us. Um, what about people who don't come to the parish? You know, how do we go out and where do we meet? Yeah. And have that encounter. Yeah, I did a I did a car blessing in the parking lot at Alabama, <laughs> you know, right next to the food land. You know, it, it is like, I mean, it was it was a you know, I mean, I, I saw you know a family friend, you know, and and you know, it, it was it was a place where we did a car blessing because that was that's how the spirit moved, you know. I mean it. Where, where can we be catechetical? So, Father Philip, just for the sake of this recording, yes, um, yes, yes. let me just um, thank everyone. Thank you all again for being present. Father Philip will um, stay online um, for a little bit after we formally end our time together. So please remember to join us again for our session three, our final session, chapters nine through 12 for the Directory for Catechesis. Please try to, to read ahead, you know, to the best of your ability um, uh, before that session. So that will take place Thursday, November 12th, same time, 9.30 to 11 o'clock. It is the same meeting link um, for that that you um, received today. But we, of course, will send out a reminder prior to that to make it easier for you. And if you have additional questions, Father Phillips' um, email is there on the screen. So you can send him his questions that he will integrate into our third and final session. So thank you and aloha from the Diocese of Honolulu. God bless everybody. God bless you. Thank you so much.